Thank you very much, uh, Dina, for the for the opportunity to speak to you all today and for the invitation. Um, I'm just sharing my screen now. I guess you can see it all the time. Um, okay, so yeah, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, and uh, again, a massive thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about um, our work on, let's say, coherent X-ray imaging, but for the application for 3D magnetism um, that we've done over the last few years. Um, and today, specifically, so I'm not going to be going into too much of the details, you know, of the coherent defective imaging techniques, but it's much more of an, uh, sort of an, a few examples of how they can be applied to be, or they can be incredibly useful for, to, by being applied to specific uh, magnetic systems. So you'll see at the, at the top of the screen that um, I have three uh, affiliations here. So as I'm, uh, as Dina said, I'm currently at the University of Cambridge doing, uh, with my fellowship. But some of the work that I'm going to show to you today was also partly done during my time at the Paul Scherer Institute and ETH Zurich, where I did my PhD in a postdoc. So um, before we get into the details of um, 3D magnetism and how we can look at them with coherent x-rays, I thought I'd first start off with perhaps the most uh, important part of the talk, which is a massive thank you and acknowledgement to the huge number of people who were involved in the work that I'm going to show you to you today, uh, without whom it really would not have been possible. So this ranges from um, the group of Laura Heiderman um, at the Paul Scherer Institute in ETH Zurich, uh, those at the Swiss light source, specifically at the CSAC beamline, um, and also at the Pollux beamline, um, and more recently my collaborators in Glasgow and um, Cambridge, and of course the funding, um, which is always very important. So now on to um, the topic of magnetism. I thought I'd start with a quick introduction or, or motivation of why magnetic systems are particularly interesting. And I think the reason that I like to think of it myself is that with magnetism, we have a wide range of very rich and interesting physics, but we also have direct, like, let's say, possibilities for apl applications. And this is kind of, um, can be thought of in a number of ways. And there's three main examples that I'd like to tell you about today. Uh, first of all, I mean, so the reason why we have so much physics and so many applications is because we can actually um, use the magnetic materials and, and, and tailor their properties in a number of ways. So, for example, we have the case that the micro and nanostructure of a mat magnetic material very much influences its behaviour, leading to possibilities to create new types of physics in pattern systems, but also being very important for, for example, permanent magnets where um, the microstructure is a key to achieving very you know efficient energy generation. We also have the formation of topological structures in magnetic systems and I'm sure you're all very aware of the magnetic skirmion which is has uh, let's see received a lot of interest and in, uh, a lot of research in the last uh, couple of decades and um, of course it's not been long it wasn't long until there was applications based on skirmions proposed um, such as new possibilities for data storage. And it's also possible to tailor the magnetization um, with, let's say, external effects, such as here, um, both with the spin, so or we can tailor the spin with, for example, charge, so with spintronics, so applying currents, but also with other, um, other let's say, uh, parameters such as heat or indeed strain. And in this way, as you can imagine, this has already led to um, a number of applications, including data storage, you know, memory, um, and also sensing devices. So we've hopefully shown you in this slide that uh, magnetism has a lot to offer. And the specific part of magnetism that I am interested in um, is, let's say, going to a higher dimension. Now, when we think about all of what I've shown you today and what we use when we look at magnets, you know, in, in, in everyday life and also in, in everyday research, the one thing that most of them have in common is that our understanding, but also the systems themselves, are quite limited to or generally consist of two-dimensional or planar systems. But when we think about going to the third dimension, so we can already see from the schematic that when we go to 3D, we have a huge number of new possibilities for geometries. And we actually find in magnetism that there's a, a, you know, a, a huge number of advancements in the actual sort of magnetic properties and the magnetic behaviour. And uh, a few examples of, of why this is so interesting. So uh, we perhaps the most well-known example of a 3D magnetic device is that of the racetrack memory, which was first proposed uh, over a decade ago now. And the idea is here that we take a magnetic nanowire and we wrap it up into a 3D uh, architecture, allowing for very high density data storage in the end. It's not only, let's say, 
density though that the three dimensionalities can give us an advantage in. We also have the possibility for new sort of uh, dynamics in the magnetization with very, very fast domain wall dynamics that um, indeed have been recognized or realized in the last few years experimentally. We have the possibility for really complex energy landscapes and new efforts uh, going into new regimes of physics in patterned magnetic structures. And of course, in topologies when it comes to topological structures and our very well known magnetic skirmion. And um, when we go to the bulk, so bulk or three dimensional systems, we, we can get these skirmion tubes and actually topological transformations within the bulk. And the, perhaps the most recent um, example of a 3D topological structure that people are very interested in is that of the magnetic hopfion. And this is kind of the, the one dimension up from a skirmion, um, not being experimentally observed yet, but people are very much, you know, on the lookout for them and, and are hoping to observe them in the in the coming years. So now that we have, uh, or hopefully I've sort of shown to you that going to three dimensions in magnetism is a, a very, let's say, interesting and exciting direction to go in. However, if we want to explore these things experimentally, we need new methods. And there are two main re regimes of, uh, let's say, method development that are needed for 3D magnetism. First of all, the fabrication, so realizing these 3D systems, but also characterizing them. So in the fabrication, um, the fabrication side, there's been a lot of um, advances in the last few years um, in essentially 3D printing techniques of magnetic materials, both with kind of coating 3D scaffolds with magnetic materials, but also directly printing magnetic materials themselves. And as you can see from these examples, we've now got a huge amount of freedom and flexibility in realizing three-dimensional magnetic nanostructures. So the next question is the fabrication we've made huge progress in, or the community's made huge progress in. The next challenge that uh, we needed to advance in was going to 3D characterization and really being able to um, image three-dimensional you know, magnetization vector fields. And of course, in the last few years, there's been a number of work uh, done uh, with essentially different probes. And in order to determine what, uh, let's see, what probe you need, you need to think about your sample and what kind of, uh, let's say the pros and cons of these different systems. So um, for example, there's been uh, 3D imaging of magnetic systems with electrons. Here with electrons, we have very high spatial resolution. So on the order of nanometers or sub, or, yeah, on the order of sub 10 nanometers, let's say. Um, but we, of course, we're limited to really thin films on the order of, you know, a couple of hundred nanometers at most. Then we have the opposite extreme where there's been examples of the imaging of 3D magnetic fields in, uh, with neutrons. And then here we're look, talking at much larger length scales. So here, you know, field of view or, or sample size of even millimeters up to centimeters in size. But again, your spatial resolution is therefore a bit lower so on the order of tens to hundreds of micrometers. And uh, finally, we have X-rays. So, um, and this is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And X-rays are particularly uh, sort of interesting for 3D systems because they bridge the gap between, let's say, uh, the electrons and neutrons, I like to think. We can retain the high spatial resolution of electrons, but we, by using higher energy X-rays, so hard X-rays, we can actually um, penetrate larger amounts of material uh, up to micrometers in size. And so today in, the, in this talk, I'm going to be talking to you about our work on 3D characterization of magnetic, magnetic systems with X-rays and specifically um, coherent X-rays. So when we think about 3D imaging, um, essentially what we're talking about is graphic techniques, where the idea is that we measure two-dimensional projections, so transmission projections, of our sample or of our structure at many different orientations with respect to your X-ray beam. Now, that's your standard tomography that you get you know, in your, for, of the electronic contrast. You get this the same thing you know, in hospitals and stuff for your CT scan. Um, now, what happens when we go to magnetic tomography? Well, there's a few ingredients that we need in order to realize this technique. First of all, 2D uh, imaging of the magnetization, so these projections of the magnetization. For this, we need a highly sensitive technique, and this is where coherent diffractive imaging techniques feed in. We then need to combine these with new types of you know, setups to, to essentially work out what combination of projections we need to probe the magnetization fully. And thirdly, we also need reconstruction algorithms to recover the 3D vector field in the end. So first of all, 2D magnetic imaging. 
And this is, as I mentioned um, already, this is where coherent reflective imaging techniques, um, let's see, take their place uh, within you know, the work that I'm going to talk to you about today. So when we're talking about the imaging of, um, of magnetic systems with X-rays, the contrast mechanism that, we're going to, that we mainly make use of is the X-ray magnetic circular diachronism. The idea here is that the um, orbital angular momentum of our light can couple to the spin angular momentum of our magnetization, a, a little bit of an oversimplification, but through this mechanism we gain, um, let's say, we're able to probe the component of the magnetization parallel to the X-ray beam. And uh, what is particularly important to note is that the energy, or so the absorption edge at which you're working at, because this is a resonant technique, really determines the strength of the uh, magnetic signal that we're going to probe. Specifically, the vast majority of magnetic imaging uh, so that has been done in the last few years um, has been mainly done with soft x-rays. And this is due to the fact that we have very, very strong X and CD signals in the soft x-ray regime, even up to 100% of the total absorption of the material. However, as I mentioned before, one of the advantages of x-rays that for looking at 3D magnetic systems is that we can go to these higher energy x-rays in order to probe thicker amounts of material. The main, uh, let's say, drawback of hard x-rays is that we have a very weak signal because we're indirectly probing the magnetic electrons of our material. And for this, we need a very sensitive and uh, high spatial resolution technique in order to probe the magnetization. And in order to, uh, let's say, come, or, you know, address this challenge, we turn to uh, coherent imaging. Specifically, we make use of dichroic tychography. Um, where we measure uh, tychographic images of our sample with C plus and C minus uh, polarizations, and we make use of the amplitude part of the complex transmission function in order to get both a quantitative uh, measure of, uh, let's say, the, our, our transmission, but also a um, very high spatial resolution. And you'll see in this first demonstration of um, hard X-ray tychography, we were able to get a spatial resolution of sub 50 nanometers, bringing the hard X-ray magnetic imaging that, or the spatial resolution that we can achieve about 50 times higher than had previously been um, achieved. So we have our, let's say our basic ingredient, which is high resolution, high sensitivity, uh, two dimensional magnetic imaging. The next question is, what combination of these images do we need? And um, what we first of all need to think about there is, what are we actually probing? So I mentioned with the XMCD that we're sensitive to the component parallel to the uh, magnet, or the component of the magnetization parallel to the X-rays. Specifically, if our X-rays are coming along Z, we're sensitive to the Z, to the Z component meaning that if we rotate our sample in the standard tomographic axis, then we are sensitive to the magnetization in the plane. However, we're not sensitive to the component parallel to the rotation axis. And in order to get around this, we actually measure two different uh, tomographic measurements, one with the sample vertical and one with the sample tilted, as you can see with this, uh, with this um, sample holder here, um, that allows us to probe all three components of the magnetization. Now that we have our 2D images measured, let's say, around these two tomographic axes, we uh, can then turn to a reconstruction algorithm that we've developed in-house in order to um, recover the three-dimensional um, magnetic vector field. So having gone over this kind of first introduction into the technique, I'll, uh, I can introduce you to the first demonstration of this um, technique where we looked at the gadolinium cobalt pillar Cut from, a focused, cut from a nugget with a focused ion beam. And the key thing to note here is that it's five micrometers in diameter, which means that with the other techniques that I've talked about before, it would not be possible to look inside. So hard X-ray imaging is really the only technique that we can use to look at the magnetization within this structure. So we can first of all use a 2D look at, at the magnetic configuration with in two dimensions to get an idea of what's going on. We see let's say, a quite a strong uh, evidence of the weakness of our magnetic signal, because with a single polarization, it's very much dominated by the electronic contrast. Whereas when we take the difference between the two circular polarizations, we get these bright and dark patches, which are um, cor which correspond to the magnetization point in parallel and anti-parallel to the, uh, the X-ray beam, showing that the sample is magnetic, but also that there's quite an intriguing sort of complex internal magnetic structure. So we measure such XMCD images for over, or 
single polarization images for over 1,000 different orientations of the sample with respect to the X-ray beam. We use our reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct the internal configuration with 100 nanometer spatial resolution. And as you can see here in this video, and I want to emphasize that this is a static configuration, we're just showing it in a relatively dynamic way. And um, we have a relatively sort of smoothly varying magnetization, but there's a number of twists and turns uh, in the structure which are particularly um, interesting. So we can have a first, uh, let's see, insight into what's going on inside by looking at a horizontal slice where we've plotted the in-plane magnetization with these streamlines and the color corresponds to the, the component perpendicular to the screen. And what we can immediately see is that we have a number of topological structures within this system. It looks relatively, uh, let's see, familiar. It was, uh, maybe reminds you of weather, <laughs> weather forecasts and everything. And this is due to the fact that um, these topological structures, of course, are not only seen in magnets, but are seen in many different um, types of systems. We see vortices where the magnetization curls around a central point. And we also see um, anti-vortices, which are the topological opposite of a vortex, and have a more saddle-like structure. Um, and again, these vortices and anti-vortices kind of form a what, what is known as a cross-tie wall that um, spans the, the diameter of our micropillar. But of course, this is a very 2D way to look at our, um, at our data. So we can go on and look at the volume instead um, to work out what's going on in three dimensions. Specifically, we look at a sub-volume which surrounds the central vortex. And when we look at the, what happens to the vortex within this sub-volume, we see, well, we can notice a few different things. So first of all, we can notice the color, which corresponds to the vertical component of the magnetization. On the left, generally, everything's pointing up. On the right, everything's pointing down. And in between, we have this white surface, which corresponds to the mag magnetic domain wall. We see actually that the core of the vortex crosses the magnetic domain wall at two points within the subvolume. And when it crosses the domain wall, it changes its topology, actually. So it changes its polarization with the direction of the core meaning that we expect the presence of singularities of the magnetization. And indeed, when we plot the magnetization in the vicinity of these crossing points, we see what looks very much like a circulating block point, what is known. So a, a magnetic singularity with um, a circulating structure in the plane and pointing up and down, above and below. And at the other point, we see a more twisted structure that we believe to be an anti-block point. So just as we had the vortex and the anti-vortex, here we have a block point and an anti-block point. And this was the first time that the, the surroundings of these structures um, were observed, even though they were predicted back in the 1960s by Feldkiller, uh, meaning that this is a really nice sort of demonstration of the new insights that we can get with this three, these 3D um, magnetic imaging techniques. And of course, uh, well, we've got these uh, new results. Perhaps what everyone may be thinking is, can we really trust them? How do we know that these are really, uh, let's say, true? So of course we wanted to validate our um, measurement and we, we, we did this by looking or, or simulating magnetic tomography on uh, three-dimensional uh, micromagnetic simulations, which had a number of uh, features that were quite similar to what we saw in the experiment. Uh, vortices and block point and anti-block points, so these magnetization singularities, and essentially by simulating a uh, magnetic tomography with all the same um, let's say parameters as we as we as we had in the experiment, we were able to determine that we we're able to get a very accurate reconstruction of these features and in general have a um, let's say overall, a pretty accurate reconstruction of the magnetization vector with the vast majority of the individual pixels um, being, you know, having an error of less than 2% in the magnitude, but also a very small error in terms of the direction, giving us a lot of confidence in that what we see in the experiment is really, uh, is really something real. So this was the first um, kind of ex demonstration of our technique, but the challenge is not over yet. And Indeed, what we are soon finding, or what we see with when we have these huge data sets, and I'm sure many of people in the audience are very familiar with big data sets, but here what we the challenge that we have is that we have these millions of pixels, each with three components of the magnetization. And the question is, how can we reliably and sort of efficiently identify the relevant structures within these systems? So this was a, a main challenge. How can we delve into these big data sets and identify, let's say, the interesting magnetic structures. So in order to do uh, to address this challenge, we've uh, developed a new type of data analysis for our magnetic configurations. 
um, specifically by implementing a calculation, which is that of the magnetic vorticity. Now, I've put this um, equation up on the slide for those of you who are interested, but essentially what the magnetic vorticity is, is a quantity that is related to the topology of our system. So if you think of our magnetic skirmions and, these, if, if, and the topological sort of index that, um, that, that quantifies that the topology is known as the skirmion number, essentially what the magnetic vorticity is, is the flux of the skirmion number density. Now, what this means is that for topological structures within our, um, within our system, we would have a non-zero magnetic vorticity vector. So, for example, for vortices, we would have a vorticity vector pointing parallel to the core of a vortex. And for anti-vortices, which have the opposite topological charge, we would have the magnetic vorticity vector pointing anti-parallel to the vortex. Again, emphasising that this is a, a, a calculable um, parameter that really is related to the topology of our configuration. So we can use this now to um, essentially identify the relevant parts or the relevant um, features within our very large data sets by first of all plotting the regions of high vorticity within our magnetic pillar where you see um, immediately th that we have this uh, kind of complex network of loops and, and tubes which correspond to the cores of our magnetic vortices and anti-vortices but it's not only uh, let's say the presence of topological structures that we can let's say identify with this vorticity vector we can also look for regions of abruptly changing topology as we saw before, this would lead to the presence or imply the presence of uh, singularities of the magnetization. And indeed, by plotting the divergence of this vorticity vector, we are able to locate singularities or block points um, very, very easily compared to, you know, looking for crossing points of different structures. Here with a single calculation, we're able to identify the presence of over 50 block points um, within, again, millions of pixels. And this is a very nice um, demonstration of how, let's say, being a bit clever or a bit in, uh, creative with our types of data analysis can really help in identifying the relevant structures that are hidden within the bulk of our system. But it's again, so it's not not only is perhaps a very overused uh, phrase in this talk, but not only can we use this um, this quantity to identify the location of our structures. But we can also use it to interpret or to understand uh, a little bit more about some features that we've actually observed. And one of the features that I want to talk to you very quickly about is some loops that we've observed in the magnetization. So these loops are formed of, again, cores of vortices and anti-vortices, uh, where you can see in this cross section, this is a vortex here and an anti-vortex here. And what is very interesting with these structures is that um, they are about 400 nanometers in diameter. And they are very much, you know, a loops. They're very much a kind of a contained three-dimensional structure. So we were very, we were kind of interested and in, intrigued by wondering what these are. But it wasn't until we plotted the magnetic vorticity around these structures that we realized that they have a circulating magnetic vorticity, meaning that these are actually magnetic vortex rings. Uh, and they're directly analogous to hydrodynamic uh, vortex rings that we're very familiar with, with smoke rings or, or, or bubble rings in fluids in more than one way, not only in the fact that they have a circulating vorticity vector, but also the fact that they are um, predicted to be only st uh, stable in a dynamic configuration. So they're not actually predicted to be static, uh, yeah, stable in a static configuration. However, however, of course, we have observed them statically here in our sample. So the next question was, well, can we understand why these, why these structures are stable? We went on to look if we could see more of these um, structures within the bulk of our pillar. And indeed, we saw a few of them, as you can see here, each with their own circulating vorticity. And we were able to determine, let's see, it, by looking in more detail and trying to understand, that it's actually some magnetostatic interaction that's, uh, that's, let's say, responsible for the stability of these structures. So again, without um, this 3D magnetic imaging technique, we would not have been able to sort of let's observe these structures, but also this has given us a lot more understanding of the physics behind three-dimensional and magnetic configurations. So hopefully with these couple of examples, I've shown you that um, magnetic tomography is very, has already given us a lot of insight into 3D magnetic systems. But of course, uh, let's see, a couple of years ago, we were we had achieved magnetic tomography. We didn't want to stop there. We knew that there was a number of different, let's say, advances in experimental capabilities that we still wanted to um, 
see, or a number of directions that we still wanted to kind of make advances along. So we identified three main, let's say, regimes in which we would like to improve our capabilities. First of all, was going to more flexible experimental geometries to be able to look at, let's say, a wider variety of samples. Secondly, was going to the fourth dimension. So we knew that a lot of the most interesting physics of 3D magnetic systems would actually involve their dynamic behaviour. And lastly, of course, going to higher spatial resolution. So could we push down the length scales that we were actually able to image the magnetization on? So first of all, the more flexible experimental geometries. Well, the first question um, may be, why do we need more flexible experimental geometries and why is tomography not a one size fits all technique? Well, the point with tomography is that we have, um, so tomography is a non-destructive imaging technique for 3D imaging. Um, and it is particularly uh, well suited for cylindrical samples. However, when we have a non-cylindrical sample, so a flat or extended sample, as you see with the silicon nitride membrane here, um, at certain direct, so certain orientations of the sample when we rotate it, we actually block the beam, meaning that we have a loss of information at certain angles and therefore lose, uh, or introduce some artifacts into our uh, reconstruction. Now, an alternative um, imaging technique that gets around this problem is laminography, where here, um, as opposed to tomography, where it's very much, um, let's see, characterised by the rotation axis being perpendicular to the X-ray beam, with the laminography, we have actually our rotation axis tilted towards the beam at a, let's say, non-perpendicular angle, um, meaning that for different orientations of the sample, with respect to the beam, we actually have a consistent amount of material, meaning that we can look at flat extended systems. And um, of course, before we could go on to immediately 3D magnetic laminography, what we needed to do was actually upgrade our um, reconstruction algorithm. So what we've done is we've um, essentially up, yeah, as I said, upgraded it, meaning that all projections measured at all different sample orientations are just combined in a single step and that the tomographic geometry is no longer assumed in our reconstruction algorithm. Now, this has actually led to sub substantial increases in construction. And with the recent implementation of GPU um, code, it has um, meant that it's a lot faster as well. So it's, um, it's really helped a lot in terms of the flexibility and, and the speed of our reconstructions. And if anyone's interested in making use of this, uh, it's available on open access online. And of course, if anyone wants to collaborate, then more than welcome to get in touch or ask questions. So we have our reconstruction algorithm. The next thing we needed was a uh, setup and um, lucky for us the high resolution um, tychographic laminography was being pioneered at the CSAC beamline at the Swiss light source at the same time. So um, here what I'm showing you is a video from Mirko um, where they looked at an integrated circuit with in tychographic laminography. And as you can see, it's very impressive. They go from really these large scales, so these large extended samples, and they can zoom in and look at the nanostructure of the circuits with the sub 20 nanometer spatial resolution. So it's a really highly effective, um, let's see, stable um, setup for laminography imaging. So we then go on to make use of this setup for magnetic laminography. And again, another uh, advantage of laminography for magnetic imaging is that this time, because we are now have our um, rotation axis at a sort of non-right angle to the X-rays, we actually probe all three components of a magnetization with one rotation axis, meaning that we only need one data set, um, so one rotation, no, projections around one rotation axis to actually recover all three components of the magnetization. And we've confirmed this with um, simulations of magnetic laminography. So the uh, sample that we're looking at here is a 1.2 micrometer thick gadolinium cobalt film into which we've patterned a, a disc of five micrometers diameter. And again, we take a tychography, so di perform di dichroic tychography to um, have a look at the 2D projections of the magnetic structure. As you can see, again, the sample is magnetic, which is great. And we have a very clear magnetic signal where we do see some change in the magnetic structure through the thickness of the, um, of, of the disc. So we measure 144 of these XMCD images around 360 degrees and for laminography. And we then use our reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct the internal magnetic configuration. 
where we're able to observe that we have a change in the magnetic anisotropy through the thickness of the film, which leads to this transition between a sort of single domain state at the top and a double vortex domain wall state at the bottom, showing that um, we have a very sort of good reconstruction or very high resolution, um, yeah, effective reconstruction of our 3D magnetic um, structure that is again mounted on these extended um, magnetic or ex extended sample holders. So this takes me on to the second uh, point on our to-do list, which is going to the fourth dimension. And it's actually with this um, laminography or the development of magnetic laminography uh, was a key step in making this possible. Specifically, because we now are able to probe flat extended samples, such as silicon nitride membranes with laminography, we're able to pattern um, contacts onto the surface of our sample. And in this way, we perform essentially a pump probe measurement, where we um, pass uh, an AC current through our strip line, which is frequency and phase matched to the time structure of the synchrotron, so 500 megahertz. And um, essentially what we do is we measure a laminography data set for um, many different time delays of the excitation with respect to the x-rays. And in this, we are able to obtain four dimensional magnetic information. So what we can first of all uh, do is we can have a look to see what this means. So what does 4D data mean when it comes to the magnetization? Well, we can first of all look at the lower half of our um, sample where we have vortex domain walls. And we see oh, here what I'm showing you is a difference image between a reference state we see that the vortex domain walls are actually oscillating from one side to the next of, a, of this white reference position. Um, and indeed, when we track the position of the vortex domain walls, we see indeed that we have a kind of breathing mode of the central domain, which all makes sense from a, from a magnetic point of view. And this is a really nice demonstration of the fact that within the bulk of our system, we're able to track the position of topological structures, essentially. So domain walls in this case um, with high accuracy. But it's not only the tracking of structures that we can do. We can also perform Fourier analysis of our 4D data, ident or isolate or pick out the parts of our systems that correspond to, let's say, rotation of the magnetization at 500 megahertz. So um, the frequency at which we're exciting our sample. And in this way, we can identify coherent rotation modes of the magnetization that we see are very closely linked to the 3D magnetic structure with, um, let's see, the, the, the rotation or the, the modes limited to kind of edge modes in the upper half of the sample, but of course, very much in the vicinity of these vortex domain walls in the lower half. And we were really happy to have this um, work featured on the, on the cover of Nature Nano earlier last year. So now that we've, um, developed magnetic laminography and we've uh, let's say taken first steps to actually imaging 3D magnet 3D magnetization dynamics. And the last point on our list was of course going to higher spatial resolutions. And um, as I'm sure many of you in the audience are very aware, for coherent defective imaging techniques, we have a it's a very exciting time, like I say, in the next few years when it comes to pushing the spatial resolution of, um, of our techniques. So when we think about um, smaller length scales, we of course know that we need higher spatial resolution or higher signal to noise ratio essentially in our data. And there's two main ways that we can do this. Firstly, is going to higher coherent flux. So with the next, uh, in the next few years, we will expect, um, or there's already, let's say, many uh, upgrades either in planning or actually in, in progress at the moment um, that will provide a uh, orders of magnitude more coherent flux. And of course, we've got the, already the next generation of, um, of synchrotrons as well, such as MAX4 in Sweden and Sirius in Brazil. And with these, let's say, three orders of magnitude more flux for these uh, techniques, we can expect to really push our spatial resolution down to in very interesting um, length scales for the magnetization. Um, let's say approaching what's known as the magnetic exchange length. So on the order of 20 nanometers or even sub 20 nanometers where our understanding of the magnetic structures and, and how they manifest themselves is starting, you know, becomes a little bit more limited. Now, um, at the moment, we don't yet have access to, um, let's see, data sets of, uh, that we can make use of this higher coherent flux. So we've gone in another direction um, let's see, in the last couple of years. And that is going to increase our signal to noise ratio. 
by going to stronger signals in the first place. And this is with soft X-rays, uh, where again, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, we have a much higher excitability signal where it can be up to about 100% of the absorption of our, um, of our magnetic material. So um, in the last couple of minutes of my talk, I'll um, give a quick uh, intro into what we've been doing on the soft x rays point of view with 3D magnetic imaging. Uh, we've not been using a coherent imaging technique, um, unfortunately, but we've been we have been able to implement laminography at the Pollux beamline, the Swiss light source, which makes the use of scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. And um, as you can imagine, when the soft X-ray regime, everything's a bit tighter, everything's obviously in vacuum as well, but uh, Katarina Vitte, a postdoc at PSI, did a really great job of um, implementing this rotation stage with, the, as you can see, the optics and the, uh, the detector, everything um, in place. And this allowed us to do our first sort of demonstration of uh, 3D magnetic imaging with laminography um, at the Pollux beamline, where we're able to map out the 3D magnetic structure of a target skirmion. So you see essentially the, the blue and the red correspond to the magnetization pointing up and down, and we have these ring-like uh, structures. So um, what this shows us is that now by making use of the, let's say, higher sensitivity or the higher XMCD signals of soft X-rays, we can now probe magnetic nanostructures and potentially, let's say in the next few years, go on to probing three-dimensional magnetic nanostructures. And I think this is also an area where um, making use of coherent diffractive imaging techniques such as soft X-ray tachography will really help um, as well to push down these spatial resolutions um, to very, let's say, interesting length scales. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude. Um, what I've shown you today is our work on applying coherent diffractive imaging techniques to three-dimensional uh, magnetic systems, specifically with our development of magnetic tomography, where we're able to, for the first time, observe these three-dimensional or the 3D structure surrounding magnetic singularities. We've also been able to, through new types of data analysis, observe uh, vortex rings in the magnetization. And with the development of magnetic laminography more recently, we've been able to map out the magnetization dynamics in 3D um, and also, let's say, take first steps towards higher spatial resolutions in soft X-rays. And going forward in the next few years, um, we're really looking forward to taking advantage of the higher flux at, or the higher coherent flux at the upgrades and the next generation synchrotrons. I think this will make a huge difference um, to the quality of the data and the, the spatial, res the length scales that we can look at the magnetization on. Uh, and with that, we'll be aiming to look at both the statics and dynamics of 3D magnetic systems, and also going on the hunt for, let's say, new types of topological magnetic structures. So um, in the last second, I'd just like to mention that next year I'll be um, starting my own group at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden in Germany. So I do have PhD positions um, available. So if anyone knows of anybody who's looking for a PhD, um, please feel free to put them in contact with me. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Claire, for this uh, uh, beautiful, impressive talk. I think really um, the, this brings coherence application to a new level. So it's really beautiful to see this. Uh, the, uh, I, I opened the session for questions. There is already one couple, a couple of them from Ian Robinson. Please Ian, unmute yourself and ask the question. And for everybody else, either you can write them in the uh, chat or you can raise your hand and I will, I think in my experience, it's more effective if you unmute yourself and then we start the discussion, it's, it's nicer. Please, Ian. Yes, well, <clears throat> thank you again, Claire. Um, very beautiful work and uh, um, very impressive. Uh, two new results uh, from uh, just published last year. That's uh, really good. Um, <clears throat> I've actually got three questions, but I won't I won't feed all of them to you right now. Maybe come back later on uh, on on some of the other ones. But the most curious question is is what is the theoretical reason why the magnetic vortex rings are not expected to be stable? Because to me, they're the same as dislocations in a in a normal crystal, and those. Um, okay, they're, they're perturbations, but there's no particular reason why, why they should not be stable. And I'm wondering why a magnetic uh, vortex ring would, would not be stable. <clears throat> so, so, th so the reason for that, and this is something that, um, that we've realized, so 
But the reason why they were not predicted to be stable was um, that in the theory work that was done in the 1990s predicting the presence of these structures, um, they mainly, they essentially only take into account um, the exchange interaction due to the fact that these are analytical models and the magnetostatic interaction, which is a long range interaction, is particularly difficult to yeah, incorporate. Now, what they saw was that essentially what you need is a nonlinear um, interaction or, or effect in order to stabilize these structures. Um, and what people have generally in the last few years have been um, sort of thinking is that therefore you need a chiral interaction so such as a jalousinski maria interaction in order to have stable 3D sort of um, configurations such as these vortex rings or indeed these hot fion structures. Now what we've seen in our, um, in our data is of course that they are stable um, and we believe that this is due to the magnetostatic interaction that is not often taken into account. Um, it is of course a nonlinear interaction or a nonlinear effect uh, spatially uh, and in our case this seems to be um, the, 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 the reason why we see these, these, see. Uh, the, these structures. Um, so, so without the DM interaction the, they, you still think they would not be stable because uh, again I'm, I'm curious so, about that. So we don't have uh, any DMI in our, in our systems and, and that's, why, uh, that's why we were quite surprised actually to see such structures. These are topologically trivial structures. I didn't, um, I didn't go into detail about that, but they are not a, uh, they're not a hot fion, they're, they're topologically trivial. But it's, um, it's really the combination of the exchange and magnetostatics that is, is leading to their, their stability. And this was quite a surprise, I think, for, for the community. Um, if, if, if I can continue into my second question, I'll skip yep. the third one. Um, uh, the, I was wondering, because of the DMI, uh, you would expect that, that you would see an asymmetry between clockwise and counterclockwise versions of these things, but you said there is no DMI here, so yeah, I yeah. guess the answer is you see equal numbers of each, each chirality, is, is that right? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's essentially because, yeah, we, we don't see any, 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 uh, any preferred chirality, uh, yeah, and I think yeah, in our system, it's we, we have no DMI, and that would be a direction that we're particularly interested in in pursuing is looking at systems that hopefully we can stabilize these structures or or somehow stabilize them, and therefore look for topologically non-trivial um, systems. So I believe that although of course we don't need to DMI in order to stabilize these structures, probably for um, higher order um, textures, we probably the DMI would help a lot. So let's hope. Thanks. Thank you. Claire, there is a question from Ash Tripathi, and he says, maybe I misunderstood, but the results you showed are absorption contrast. Did you uh, go on the resonance or to a part of the resonant edge where you could see only phase, or is this interested or not? interesting or not? Can you so I, I can show you um, a slide that, uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right um, that we are using the absorption contrast of our Sorry. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're using the absorption contrast and the reason for that is, so um, when, we, when we go to, of course, with tychography, we have access to the full complex transmission function. So we, um, we, we have access to both the phase part and the absorption part of the XMCD signal. So you can see um, in this sort of earlier work when we were first developing 2D magnetic imaging with tychography, you see this quite clearly that we have this absorption um, in red, which where we have this, this, this peak at, at, the, at the absorption edge. But of course, we also have this kind of um, phase contrast where we, where we actually flip the contrast of the signal um, let's say above and below. Now what we find for our, um, essentially for high spatial resolution imaging of magnetic um, structures is that uh, the absorption contrast essentially gives us higher signal to noise ratio and higher spatial resolution. So that's the reason why we choose to use this absorption contrast um, part of, 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 of our magnetic, let's say projections. Now what this, of course, um, it maybe seems a bit strange that we're throwing away part of our, our information. When we're, when we're measuring at the maximum absorption or maximum absorption contrast or the energy that corresponds to the maximum absorption contrast, we have almost zero um, magnetic signal in the phase. And that's the reason why we can't use a combination of both. 
But for example, when it, we come to, um, let's say, thicker systems, that would be very highly absorbing. And we're already looking at some systems where we're really at the, at the limit of trans getting even hard x-rays through our samples. That's where the phase may be um, an advantage, where we can measure slightly below the absorption edge and get a relatively high um, signal to noise ratio in our in our images. So it's a bit of a um, yeah a compromise in terms. And what we've been really looking for or looking for is optimizing the image quality rather than choosing a particular part. I hope that helps answer the question. Um, actually, I had a question following this. Is it clear why we have a better resolution with the absorption rather than in phase? So, from a principal point of view. So, so we have looked into uh, um, we have looked into this, and as far into a few years ago, actually, as far as I remember, the main reason is just the, the let's see, imaginary part of the scattering factor is just a bit stronger in this case. So um, when it comes to these kind of resonant effects with the magnetization, we do just have, we have a, a stronger, a stronger scattering. Um, but yeah, I, I, if, if I can definitely look into that again and possibly come up with a better answer if you're, if you're interested in more detail. Okay. So there is another question from Lee, Lee um, concerning the slice of circular left and right data from magnetic tomography. How did you get this, do you reconstruct the data with circular right and circular left separately and then you do reconstruction? So um, that's, a, that's a very good point. So when it comes to, let's see, when it comes to tomography, uh, you can see, or perhaps it makes sense here. For tomography, we have the case that um, C plus and C minus, um, no, zero and 180 degrees are essentially the same orientation. So what we actually do to avoid, so we're, we're um, creating our circular light using a face plate and to avoid moving the face plate during the measurement, we essentially just measure with one circular polarization, but measure around 360 degrees. And in this way, we effectively get take XMCD images around um, 300 or 180 degrees. Now for laminography, where we have this uh, alternative geometry, we have, uh, the case that let's say zero and 360 degrees, no, zero and 180 degrees, sorry, um, are no longer equivalent. So we actually measure C plus and C minus around 360 degrees. So it's a bit different. Okay. Um, so other questions, please. Don't be shy. Unmute yourself and uh, or raise your hand. Hi, 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 Dina. Hi, Claire. I, I may have a very quick one if I if I do not uh, take time from yeah. anybody else. Um, so, in, in your in your three D system, I think you can assume that your uh, incoming beam is constant. The property of your incoming beam is constant all along the three D uh, object that you are. It's it's not like in optics, for instance, where if you have a birefringent material, the incoming field would be. Uh, transformed and distorted as uh, all along the, the beam path through the samples, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're absolutely right. We just we we assume essentially, yeah. So we assume parallel um, illumination, and we assume that it's a, it's, it's constant. A yes, it doesn't change. So yeah, that's cool. That's exactly. Nice. exactly. Thank you. Abby, any other questions? I, I am sure. Uh, I have a sort of a general question because I, I, I work with some, I, I think probably I work with some things that may be comparable in, in like the tomographic um, department with, with also with CSAX data with um, yeah. a, a small angle x-ray scattering. Uh, I'm just a bit curious, like when you run your, your uh, reconstruction algorithms on like these big data sets, what sort of time scales are we talking about for, for like a, whatever you consider a normal size data set, or could you give me some examples of, of the computation so, resources and time computer, needed? Yeah, so um, of course, as you know, this very much relies on, or it depends on the size of the data yeah, set, yeah, yeah. So, which is di directly related to the volume that we're looking at. So um, the, the first thing I can say is that we've, when we went to the, let's say the 
up upgrade of our reconstruction algorithm we went to the gpu this made a huge difference so it brought yeah. down our our computation times from the order of you know hours 10 hours even down to you know 10 minutes so it's made mm -hmm. a complete difference uh, or a huge difference which really means that we can kind of run reconstructions yeah, on the go yeah. at, the, at the beam line which makes a big difference now for the um to give a couple of examples for the laminography data set mm -hmm. which for this is a relatively small volume it's you know just over a micrometer thick and five micrometers in diameter mm -hmm. this takes probably about uh, just a few minutes to reconstruct yeah, yeah. the internal reconstruction or the internal configuration more recently we were looking at a lot much larger system which was like a about 10 micrometers thick and really looking at about 20 micrometers in diameter of the of the area that we were that we were reconstructing and this was then taking again hours so it is yeah. quite a computation heavy yeah no no I have a similar situation here so I, I was uh, just curious yeah no but it's definitely yeah it's it's now more manageable but um I think there's a lot that we can do to improve yeah yeah it. as long as it's not like months or, or weeks at least <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. Especially once you realize you've done something wrong and you need to repeat it. But yeah, it's uh, it's manageable at the moment. Yeah. But it definitely we're going to look into trying to improve these things. Mm -hmm. I think. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, I will. I have a one, a silly one, so maybe that helps everybody else to uh, bring up some more interesting question. Um, do you have a sense why you had this? Uh, you have a, you have a limitation on the accuracy for the determination of the magnetic momentum and direction. Do you have a sense what is this? What is this due to? What is this limitation? Is it experimental? With the with the reconstruction, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. So um, so first thing I would say is the numbers that I showed in this slide. So this two percent and two percent in the magnitude, and I think it was like fifteen degrees in the in the um in the direction when we use the new type of reconstruction algorithm where we combine all of the projections in one single step this gets brought down really it, it decreases a lot but the main source of error is a, is actually a fundamental one um essentially it, it comes from the it's a fundamental thing that's that is uh, it's to do with the x-ray magnetic circular diachronism so we're com sensitive to the component of the magnetization parallel to the x-ray beam what this means is that Imagine if you have a, have a hedgehog structure, so a highly divergent structure, where we have something, you know, thing, two things pointing in or two things pointing out. The net, mag the net magnetic contrast that we get from that is zero. So, um, and of course, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference in a projection between, you know, an all-in or an all-out hedgehog, essentially. So, um, and indeed, that's what we see. We've done quite a lot of um, looking into what the limitations are, and we essentially get our errors are um, very much correlated with the presence of divergent structures such as block points or, or textures in the magnetization. Um, but saying that, although there is this kind of fundamental limitation, we see that it still actually works surprisingly well. So we'll get higher errors in the vicinity of really the center of these, for example, the singularities. Um, but the, and, and therefore, but that, when we get the error, it's mostly um, manifests in a decrease of the magnitude of the magnetization. So the direction of the magnetization is surprisingly still re reconstructed with a very high degree of accuracy. So it is a fundamental thing, and we're actually looking at combining this, um, let's see, this this type of contrast with other types of contrast to try and get around this uh, this limitation. But, uh, so yeah. Richard Sandberg has uh, requested. Hi, Claire. Uh, wonderful results. Really amazing. And sorry if I missed it, if you've already discussed it about the time resolved images mm -hmm. um, where you're doing the AC pumping. How often are you taking a tomograph or a laminography image there? Could you tell me a little bit about how many positions you're doing, how many rotation angles for the yeah, time result? Yeah. Exactly. So um, essentially what we did, so we were exciting the sample at 500 megahertz. We were, we were exciting actually with the Orsted field of our strip line, so not directly with the current. And we measured eight, um, eight time steps or, or snapshots. So um, this is every 250 picoseconds. Uh, and for each of those snapshots, we took 144, or, yeah, 288 projections. So one, 144 different orientations. Um, of, of the sample, with, you know, around this 360 degrees. Uh, so it's a lot of um, a lot of data, but due to the smaller volume of the um, 
of the sample that we were looking at, so this disc, which is a bit smaller than the, than the big macro pillar, we were able to squeeze this into the, the constraints of a beam time. I think uh, this is one of the, or actually we got extra, we got, we were lucky enough to be given some in-house beam time as well as our, let's say, official beam time, which allowed us to really measure this data. And I think this is one of the main restrictions at the moment is the time it takes to measure these, these data sets. So this is something that's also with the increase in coherent flux is going to make a, a massive difference with the feasibility. Oh, okay, so that was more of a, a, if I understand, it was more of a stroboscopic measurement. It wasn't yes. like single shots you were doing. No, no. Okay. So the, okay. the nice. limitation with this, the, it has to be stroboscopic because we need to measure many different orientations. Um, even for tomography, we need to measure many different projections um, for a single time stop. So I don't think that the single shot uh, technique would be... Would work. Would work, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I see that there is no other uh, people who are uh, asking uh, for questions. I actually have one, Claire, and yeah. it's a little bit more generic. It's, you know, you were mentioning um, the development of new sources and the increase of coherent flux, and you know, there is a dramatic increase of coherent flux actually in the soft X-ray regime, <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but then the 3D, it's maybe not really compatible with the, with the soft X-rays, but then you're interested in nano structures. So where do you see that actually increase, dramatic increase of coherent flux in the soft X-ray regime can actually help you in your research, considering the difficulty and considering that when you go to such small structures, then maybe other techniques can be a bit more efficient. Uh, I mean, it's a big field, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's a really good, it's a really good um, point. So we have been doing, as I showed, we we had we have been doing some um, some soft X ray sort of three D magnetic imaging, and there, okay, we're working at the positive beam mag where it's a bending magnet, so we're very much limited by the flux. But the the one of the difficulties the difficulties that we've been having is um, that we have highly so when you go to these three D structures and you have a lot of electronic contrast because you and they can be really quite um, highly absorbing. Um, an increase in flux in any case is really we're really desperate for photons at this case. Um, in terms of tychography and and soft X rays, I think if we want to really go down to interesting length scales, and by that I mean even reaching towards sub 10 nanometers spatial resolution, which would be really important for these 3D magnetic nanostructures. Um, I, th I think that tychography is the way to go, um, really, rather than perhaps um, stick some more or, or TXM and stuff. And I think that's where these, incre this, these increases in um, coherent flux will allow us to go to higher spatial resolution to really push, push the um, magnetic imaging sub 10 nanometers. But also, um, a little bit related to the previous question, I think it will really help with the throughput of measurements. So if we want to do time resolved or, or quasi static measurements, you know, where we where we change some parameters such as magnetic field or temperature and stuff and and really are be able to measure 3D data sets um, for multiple different um, configurations, you know, in the time restraints of a, of a beam time, I think this is also that like the pure, the, essentially the time taken for a measurement will really benefit from the from the increase in flux. So I do think that soft X-rays are are going to be equally as um, as useful when it comes to the upgrades as hard X-rays. I see in the audience there are many beamline scientists. Do you have a request for for us? <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think uh, having, I mean, having the the option to measure these, um, so essentially to measure with high high spatial resolution, but also with the combination of, for example, the laminography or the tomographic geometry. If we have that possibility, um, we have the reconstruction algorithm. So if anyone is interested in, let's say, trying out magnetic three D magnetic imaging at their beamline, um, I'd be more than happy to talk about. Uh, speaking to people and getting things up and running and hopefully getting more people uh, interested in, in the technique. Great, thank you so much Claire. Thank so you very much.